everybody, this is the weekend, so finally, finally I say, I will finally get to review not only a very good Alfred Hitchcock movie, but his best movie. Better than Rear Window, better than Psycho, better than I Am For Murder, better than everything that brilliant man has ever done. This is an absolute mega treat. I love this movie so much, almost every single aspect of it is absolutely astounding. We are going to talk today about a movie that is so good that the only things I really don't like about it is actually some of the technical aspect this movie has. I only have one question. Why is this movie called North by Northwest? Is it based on, you know, the book or is it something that was said in said book that this movie maybe was based on maybe that um, was the reason for it? Or was the working title that then became a permanent title? I don't know, but I do know is that today we are going to take a look at one of the grand masterpieces of cinema of all time. This is North by Northwest. plays Mr. Thornhill. Mr. Thornhill is a normal man living in New York City and he's going to lunch with some of his friends. And during this lunch there is a mix-up of names and he is mistaken for a Mr. Kaplan. Some unsavory characters overhears this and when he leaves the restaurant he's apprehended by these people who takes him to a small place in upstate New York uh, where he meets James Mason who, you know, try to ask what he wants and what his plans are and stuff like that. And even though Thornhill tried to explain to him that he is not Kaplan, they don't believe him. And they're trying to interrogate him. They almost kill him by, you know, in his car, you know, by, you know, pouring lots of liquor into him and stuff like that. And afterwards, nobody believes that this happened and nobody buys his story. But he can't let the thing go. He simply has to find out who this Kaplan is and why these people are so interested in finding him. And who are these people that James Mason is running around with who seems to be a bit unsavory and a bit nasty and stuff like that. So he tries to, you know, walk in the footsteps of Kaplan and everybody seems to think that he is Kaplan. And he's very confused by this and then he ends up in the United Nations and then all of a sudden he is accused of murder and now he is a wanted man and is on the run from the entire nation while not having any type of disguise at all. This is something that always bothers me in movies, not just this movie, every movie. Nobody who is on, you know, a manhunt puts on a disguise. Harrison Ford cut off his beard from, you know, The Fugitive. That was about it. In this movie, Thornhill wears sunglasses to try to disguise himself. That is not a very good disguise. Not even in 1959 was, would that would have been a good disguise. Come on, Carrie, wear a fake beard or a wig or a fake mustache. Or, you know, if your character would have been played by James Stewart, a fake personality since you don't have one. But we're getting sidetracked. Anyway, so he finds this mysterious woman played by Eva Marie Saint and um, who can help him along the way. Why she's helping him, we don't know. It cannot be only because he has a quote-unquote a nice face. And so she says. And uh, so is he going to find out who James Mason is? Is he going to find out who this George Kaplan actually is? And who is this mysterious professor that kind of lurks in the shadows and pulling strings? We shall see. This movie is just so much fun to watch. 135 minutes just storms by. Considering that this movie was made in 1959, the pacing of this movie is incredible. There's always stuff happening. There's always, you know, new twists and turns that we have to go on. And it almost feels like kind of an adventure movie. This doesn't really feel like a, th a thriller. This almost doesn't feel like a thriller. This almost feels more like an adventure movie, a matinee adventure that has some, you know, fun suspense to it. This is not, you know, the chilling suspense. This is fun suspense that we are experiencing. Cary Grant is just so fantastic in this movie. Handsome, charismatic, energetic, everything that, you know, a certain hatred of mind uh, does not possess. And even though he's technically older in this movie than 
uh, James Stewart was in Vertigo, the uh, age difference between him and Eva Marie Saint doesn't feel as jarring as it did in Vertigo. We still buy it more in this movie than in, you know, Vertigo, but I have ragged on that movie for too long. Very good movie, technically fantastic. I don't like James Stewart. This movie is so filled with fantastic characters. Grant is awesome. Eva Marie Saint is awesome. James Mason, one of my low-key favorite actors of all time, steals the show. And they also have a lot of fun and interesting side characters that, that you know, fill out the ranks. And on top of that, we have these iconic moments. You know, the crop duster outside of Chicago, the entirety of, you know, the thing in Mount Rushmore, and the fucking ending. It is such a, an amazing ending. It's one of my favorite endings of all time. I would call it the best rushed ending of all time. It is so rushed, but it is such a fantastic ending that you go, yes, that is exactly what this movie needs. So this is sort of an agent story, sort of a manhunt story, sort of a murder mystery, but we already know who you know, is pulling the strings and who did what to who and basically why. This is a classic case of no too much syndrome. Sometimes this thing doesn't work, but sometimes, especially if the movie is directed by Alfred Hitchcock, it do work. I mean, Dial M for Murder, maybe his second best movie of all time, revolves around the entirety that we know what has happened, but you know, the other persons can't figure the thing out. The same thing can be said about Psycho. And sometimes they work. In this case, it works gangbusters because right from the get-go, like the end of the first act, we know almost the entire plot of this movie and yet we stick around because we don't quite know where this one's going and when he's faced with different situations, we don't quite know how he's going to get out of it. This movie has, you know, a funny, you know, gleeful vibe to itself that makes this movie never grow too dark because I would imagine if you would make a remake of this one, God heavens forbid, don't do that. Don't get any ideas. It would have been, you know, this grim, hard, you know, man on the run thing, who can he trust, blah, blah, blah. In this movie, it is not required. And this movie looks just so good. The cinematography is absolutely astounding. The shot looks just so epic. And it's all wrapped around in fantastic Technicolor. You're just amazed by how great it looks. Uh, there are a few occasions where you see that this movie has aged somewhat and it needs to be addressed. Some of the technical aspects of this movie does not really hold up, especially when, you know, Thorn is driving drunk and stuff like that. It looks bad and you know the fights that they're having look so fake and so contrived But if you would watch any old James Bond film for instance, they all look kind of contrived and hokey So that is okay, but the music is probably the thing that bothers me the most Soundtracks made in the 1950s were usually not that great and usually had the same vibe to them And all of them sounded the same and were used the same so it always felt like okay We're going for this and we're going for that and sometimes you know They were you know too dramatic and it was too much and it got a little bit too much of an overbearing feeling towards itself But apart from that this movie is almost perfect fantastic chemistry between Saint and Grant Grant is, as I said, fantastic. Fantastic small little details. And we also have to talk about the cogs of various sizes that help this movie elevate itself from a fantastic movie to cinematic masterpiece. Because all of these small little things that you don't think are going to matter will matter later. So all of these small cogs um, help the rest of the movie elevate itself. If you're bad at spotting these small little details, you will be highly rewarded. And even if you spot them, you will say, Oh, I told you that was going to uh, come in place later. I love that. So the movie is filled with great suspense, great actors, fantastic characters, great side characters, fantastic immortal moments that will live on, you know, for the rest of humanity, and a great fucking ending. There is just these, you know, technical shortcomings and the lackluster soundtrack and some bits of this movie that doesn't quite hold up, but the rest of the movie hasn't aged a day. Hitchcock's best movie, North by Northwest, gets 95 points. This is a fantastic thriller. It's a fantastic matinee adventure. It is a fantastic spy thriller. It is a fantastic mystery, all at the same time. Great actors, great pace for such an old movie, extremely entertaining, and to top it all off, three of my favorite actors from the 1950s doing perhaps their greatest work of all time.
So do you think that North by Northwest is the best Hitchcock movie of all time? Comment below and I'll see you next time from, well, so-and-so reviewing, well, such and such. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much.